Please appreciate the truth that was in that song. Such a beautiful song. But uh, for the child of God today, I believe our hearts should always be hungry for him. And I believe that's what the psalmist was trying to say in uh, this particular section. Psalms 119, we're going to continue tonight in verse number 33 through verse number 40. Um, I feel like we'll finish this particular part tonight, so you pray for us. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the paths of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Father, we pray you would open your word to our hearts tonight. Speak to us clearly as your own. We hear your voice and we hunger for this truth. We pray for it. Speak it into us, God, that our souls, Lord, may receive it, that it might be planted as a great tree that will grow and bloom and bear fruit for you. We ask it believing as we pray for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. The first part of this we've already preached, and I'll try to be careful not to get back in that, even though my soul is drawn to that truth concerning the need for God to arrest my mind, teaching me and giving me understanding, but then also moving upon my will to help me go the ways that he would have me to go, and to do the things that he would have me to do with a spirit within me to do it. But in verse number 37, he changes gears again. A similar request, as the song was sung, our hearts always hunger for, I believe we see into the psalmist here, another desire. And he says simply, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. As I thought about what he said already concerning the mind and the will, I think now he speaks directly to those actions of the flesh. A lot of the things we do scripturally, we learn that we do because our heart desires it. A lot of the things the flesh does is simply minding what we tell it to do. And whether or not we bring the flesh under subjection is always the greatest question. And yet we find here the psalmist praying and asking God to turn away his eyes from the things of this world that are quite clearly here meaningless, vanities. I want to read for context what Solomon wrote about the same subject in Ecclesiastes 2 verse 9. He said, so I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. Notice he mentioned his eyes. Whatever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy for my heart 
rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. We know Solomon, obviously, God had made to be the wisest of all and had certainly from that wisdom blessed him beyond measure. And we find here Solomon admitting that he kept whatever his eyes saw and wanted, he took it, he bought it, he got it. Whatever pleasure he wanted, he experienced. Whatever he wanted to do, he did it. And in the end, what Solomon said was, is that all was meaningless. The word vanity, you'll find in the Hebrew text here, means nothingness or emptiness or meaningless. And what David was saying was, God, I want you to turn my eyes away from the things of this world. And let me try to categorize for us the things of this world. We often are enamored by those things that shine and those things that the world has given value. But may I say to you, in the end, they are meaningless. We will not stand before God and offer some accolade of this life as some merit to his favor if we have rejected his son. You know why? Because everything of this world is going to melt away. It's going to burn in a fervent heat. There's not anything physically that will not be touched by the hand of his judgment and his power. And what we'll find in the end is that all of the time and the effort and the, and, and the, and the work that we put into so many things of this life, we'll find in the end that they did not mean anything eternally. They didn't have any, any lasting value. They didn't have anything that was merit unto God or brought favor of God. These are the things of life that trap men and ensnare them and pull them in ways that lead them off away from God and the things of God. And here, the psalmist was willing to admit, God, I need you to help me because our eyes are prone to look to the shining. It's prone to look to the, the things of this world where we're often directed by the enemy's snare uh, in our eyes to look upon things of this world that are not wholesome and not good and that are mean meaningless in the end and friend if you're not careful what goes in the eyes will infect the heart you can be certain that if it's of this world it has no eternal value we're reminded by the creation that God has made and all of the things that his handiwork has been a part of. He reminds us that when we look upon those things that we're not to worship the creation itself, but we worship the creator that made it. You see, worshiping creation is vanity. It's meaningless. It's nothingness. And yet some people think that that's how we worship God is we go out and we worship his creation and we do this for it and we do that for it. May I say today, apart from worshiping the Lamb of God itself, it is all vain. Even Solomon was admitting in the last days of his life, having, having had to not spare any expense, he was the richest of all before him. He said, whatever my eyes looked upon, he said, I didn't withheld, withhold from it. Whatever I wanted, I took it. Whatever I, I, I needed, I bought it or, or, or I built it or all of these things. And, and, and all of these things that Solomon did, certainly they're admirable. You can read about the things that Solomon did as a king and they were beyond measure above what others could ever imagined or did. And in the end, yet what Solomon said that my eyes got me into more trouble. My eyes led me into more vain things of this world and, and actions and, and, and projects and all of these things. He said in the end, they had no meaning. They were vain. We read in the scripture about those that followed after the flesh. The scripture said Ananias and Sapphira, remember? Right, they... They owned some property. <laughs> and yet we find that so that they looked well in the eyes of others, they decided that they would 
sell that property and claim to give all of the money, the proceeds back to the church. And, and, and what they did was lied about it. They kept back part of the portion of that money. They, they, they hid that part. And when they brought it to the apostles, Peter, by the Holy Spirit's direction, knew just exactly what they had done and said to, said to Ananias, he said, why has Satan filled your heart? So many times our eyes get us in trouble and yet we hear here the psalmist being honest enough to say, Lord, I need your help. How many times have we been snared by looking upon something too long? How many times have we dwelt with our eyes upon something of this world or someone of this world and soon our heart is infected with some lust or covetousness and it draws us away from God and what the psalmist is saying, what Solomon was saying, what they're all saying is that when our eyes lead us astray from the things of God, it is meaningless stuff. It is vanity, it is empty, it is nothingness. David said, Lord, turn my eyes away from beholding vanity. The things of this world that appeal to the flesh are often the very things that steer us from God. Vanities of life, things that we pour so much time in, right? Isn't it true? I'm not saying we shouldn't have hobbies and there shouldn't be things we do and that work is wrong. What I'm saying is is that when it becomes an obsession for any of us, when our eyes are focused on this one thing, let me tell you something. If you can't put a hobby down to go to church, you've got a problem. If you can't stop working to go to church, you've got a problem. Because none of that stuff has meaning or value that will last eternally. If anything steers us away from God, I assure you it is vanity. It is nothingness. It is meaningless. It is simply a way to feed one's flesh and satisfy its own lust and desire. Whatever that desire may be, whether it's leisure or joy or an experience or whatever those things may be. You can, you can put a tag on it and claim that it's anything. But I tell you, there's more people today running around this world following what their eyes see and they're heading off into directions that have no eternal value. They're meaningless. They will get to the end of their lives and everything that they have built, I don't care if it's worth billions, it does not matter if eternally they're bankrupt. What good is having a million dollars? What good is having $10 million? If you're laying in a casket, you will take nothing with you. So tell me what a billion dollars means. What does it mean to be a billionaire? I'll tell you what, it's vanity. It is a vexation of the spirit is what Solomon said. It was the snare that pulled him down. It was the very thing that that caused him to bring in uh, hundreds of women into his own harem. It was a snare that caused him to uh, relinquish and to bow unto other gods from these wives. It was a snare. It was vanity and he declared it so. What about you? What is it that we chase more than God? There's people right now that are doing other things. They're not here, right? I I get it. Some can't be here, but there's plenty that could be here. And they're not. You know why? Because there was something more important than God. If your eyes are on anything that leads you away from God, I'll assure you it is empty. It is nothingness, it is vanity, it is meaningless exercise of the flesh and it will not bring any eternal value. I wonder why the flesh is so bent on doing its own thing and yet the scripture teaches us that it's enmity to God. Our flesh despises the things of God. I don't, you don't have to tell me, (laughs) right? I'm just as human as the next person. Do I get tired? Yes. Do I feel bad? Yes. Are there things that I'd like to do? Yes. But you know what? 
If there's anything that gets in front of God, one thing that I've learned is the better thing to do is to cut it off from me. Just turn away from it. Lord, help me, he said. Turn my eyes from the vanity of this world that my eyes behold, those things that see that lead me astray. Did he know what he was talking about? Yeah, did he not from a balcony look down upon a woman bathing? Was it not his eyes that were infecting his heart because he looked and lusted after But Did he not know what he was talking about? We best take note. Here's a man that did fall. Here's a man that did allow his eyes to infect his heart, allowed the lust of his own heart to follow the vanity of the flesh, commit adultery with Bathsheba, to lie, then murder, to cover up his indiscretion. Oh, how quickly we get off track when our eyes behold vanities. I may not be preaching to this crowd, but I hope maybe somebody's listening. If there's anything that keeps you from God, you need to get rid of it. You need to be honest enough as the psalmist was is to say, Lord, I need you to help me in my mind. I need you to help me in my will. And he said, I'm going to go as far as to say, I want you to turn my eyes away from beholding vanity. People are snared all the time. And uh, I, I was trying to think of the words of that old country song today, but it, 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 it went somewhat something along these lines that not everything that shines is gold and not everything that glitters is diamonds. People are so quick to chase after something that they think would quickly fill the flesh or quickly satisfy one's covetousness or longingness. May I say to you today, it's just vanity. It's just vanity. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. And then he said, and quicken thou me. What he meant was, make me live in thy way. Because the one thing that I can assure you is not vanity. It's not emptiness. It's not nothingness or meaningless. The one thing that, that we can absolutely prosper from and know that what we're doing is laying up treasure in heaven is to follow God. Is to walk in the way of his precepts. To live in a way that is lined up scripturally with what God has mandated for us as being the life, the way, the truth. All of those things that Christ has established for us and those guardrails and barriers in our lives that have prevented us from going astray or falling off the cliff. Listen, what he's trying to do is to make us live in the way of his precepts. And all David understood that. He said, turn my eyes away from the vanity of this world. So many things of this life are vain. Now, I don't think God intends for any of us not to have hobbies or enjoy life or to experience uh, those good things that he's provided. Not at all. But if we ever let those things become greater than him, they have become vain and empty exercises of the flesh. Because if you desire, if you, listen to what he said on down here, if you long in your heart for those things that simply satisfy one's flesh, those things you will find in the end, they are nothing but vain. They are just vanities. They are meaningless exercises of the flesh. Establish thy word unto thy servant. Verse 38 who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear from thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in, the, in thy righteousness. There he said it again. Make me live in thy path. Make me live in thy righteousness. Those things that honor God, those things that are actually working to our benefit are those things that are of God. 
And so many are spending and wasting all of their time and their effort and their abilities in this world on the things of this world. All the while they could be laying up treasure in heaven. In the end when we stand before God there won't any of us say I wish I'd have spent more time fishing. Hear me. I wish I'd have spent more time hunting. We will not say that. Those things have no eternal value. Does he allow us to do them? Yes. Do, do we find pleasure in doing them? Yes. There are things that we can do. That right? It's not against the will of God to do these things. But when we put them ahead of God, yeah. I don't care if you're woodworking, I don't care if you're, you're, whatever it is you're doing, when you put it before God, that suddenly has become an empty endeavor and has no eternal value. We have to be careful that our eyes don't cause us to behold vanities and bring the covetousness of our heart out. Quicken me, he said. Make me live in the way. Make me live in the paths of your righteousness. Help me. He was crying out, God, help me. I see where I've made mistakes. I see where I put things in front of you that should not ever be. What in, in life then is not vain? Well, I believe when we get to heaven, we'll not have regretted any time that we loved someone more than ourselves. I believe when we get to heaven that those things we truly did from a heart devoted unto God and to his fear, we will not regret any of those things. I believe every time that we stood for the Lord Jesus Christ to expose truth to some other soul is in some way or another investing eternally in something that will matter in the end. You, 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 you talk about retirement. Right, And surely all of us are, are doing our best to try to plan for a time when we have no income, right? We're trying to at least be careful that we're ready for that time when we no longer have a job. And yet I'll suggest to you to, the best thing you can do is to lay up treasure in heaven. You're talking about interest. You're talking about doubling your investment. You talk about something that goes beyond human comprehension. That if I'll just give to God, that somehow or another there is something happening eternally. That when I stand before him, he might even say, well done. I fear I'm not there yet. I fear I'm not done enough. I fear I've not followed in the paths of his righteousness. And yet David understood this truth and he said, God, help me. Help me. If it takes it, turn my head, turn it from beholding vanities. Because these things are meaningless and they have no value. When it comes to the end, these are the things that won't have mattered. And yet some of them I have spent most of my life doing. It's important that we recognize this truth. David was honest enough to expose his own life before you and I as this example and say, you know what? I need God to help me with my mind, right? I need him to teach me and to give me understanding. I need him to help me with my will. He said, make me do this and incline my heart for that. He said, but I also need God just to help me every day to not devote more time to things that are meaningless <laughs> Oh, God, have mercy on us. <clears throat> I got to say it again. How much TV do we watch versus reading the Word of God? You're talking about vain activity. Listen to me. <laughs> the flesh is prone to that, and you know what draws it? These two things right here. they good at catching these two things right here. And before you know it, you've sat and indulged in hours of entertainment that are absolutely meaningless. Amen? Amen. Let's tell the truth. Amen. We all done it. David said, God, help me. Now, he's no different than we are. God, help me, he said. 
turn my eyes from the vanity of this world, the meaningless endeavors, the things that I do that do not matter. God help me. So what does matter? Let me see if I can just close with this thought. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, the apostle Paul said it like this. He said, he said, be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in what? The work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Wait. Say that again then. Be therefore steadfast. Unmovable for God. What's that mean? It's made my, my head don't turn for the world. God help me, my head don't turn that everything that glitters that goes by. We used to make a joke about a fellow that I worked with. He was so easily distracted. I mean, we'd even be in meetings and then he'd chase off after something and we was all wondering what, what in the world is he talking about? And we finally just was following that cartoon. You know, we say, squirrel. <laughs> you know, because everything he saw, he just, it was, he couldn't. We're that way. Yeah. Spiritually, we're often that way. When the devil just bark and 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 shout and flash something glittery, or and and our, when we quickly turn and we look and our eyes behold it, and instead of allowing ourselves that that very discipline David was asking for, we we begin to follow the vanity of the of our eyes. We begin to follow that lust of our heart, the covetousness of our heart. So he said, be therefore steadfast, unmovable, unmovable, right? Not chasing everything in this world, but fixated in the mind and and, and keeping your eyes on Jesus, keeping your eyes on him. Let us be therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding. Abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain. What we do for God is not meaningless. It is not nothingness. It is not empty. What we do for God, even though I can't even see the effects of it sometimes. I don't even know if it's helping. I don't even know if it's... It, 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 we need to turn our eyes away from this world and fix it on those things that we know have eternal value and let God settle the account later. Because I can assure you, there's a reckoning coming. And he's gonna judge me one day. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter number three, and I'll close with this, he's gonna try every work of my life, whether it was good or or evil, he will try it. He will check it. He will find the source, the motivation of everything that I have ever done. He will judge me of every single thing. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter number three, the eyes of his, the flame of his fire in his eyes will judge every work of every man. And if it is of wood, hay, and stubble, you know what will happen? It's burnt, and the only thing that is left is ashes. And you know what you do with ashes? They are meaningless. They are empty. They have no value. 
And all that stuff you chased of this world, all that time that you put into the things of this world that your eyes led you to do and the covetousness and the lust of your heart and the desire for pleasure or leisure or whatever it is, all of those things will burn and amount to nothing when we get to heaven. But he said those things that his eyes try that are gold and silver and precious stones. You see, when you apply fire to any of those things, it just makes them more pure. When he looks at those, those are the things that will still be there. Those are the things that were done for God. Those are the things that we did not for ourselves, but for someone else in the glory of him. They weren't vanity. They weren't meaningless. No, they're in heaven. They're the treasures that have been laid up. They'll be there if we've done them. They'll be there, and they'll be a part of that judgment. Then what do we do? Here's the application as I ask them to get us home. Here's the application. I've already said it. David said it like this. He said, Lord, just, I need you to help me with this. Right? He was willing to confess that that for some reason I just can't quit turning my head and following those things that that have no value. So he said, I want to surrender mind, will, and body. And he said, I want you to help me. I want you to focus my eyes on the things that are of you. Quicken me. Make me live in this way. Make me live in the path of your righteousness. And he was honest enough to say that, God, I need you to help me with that. I just can't do it by myself. And so what do we do? The application is simple. We know the truth. We're not ignorant to this. We know what he said to do and what he said not to do. What we need is to be steadfast, in this, unmovable, right? Though the world hollers and flashes its glittery, its glittery sign, we, we don't turn our heads. We're not wavered by the things of this world. We remain steadfast, unmovable, and we abound in the way, the work of the Lord. We put ourselves in the work of God, and we commit to it every single day. You say, preacher, that sounds like a boring life. May I say to you today that it ain't about this life. Treasures here I may never have. There's plenty that would look upon me and think me quite poor. But I'll assure you I am not. My treasure is there. Are you certain? Yes. I am absolutely certain. If I have anything when I die, Jeff, somebody else will get it. Ain't you glad it's that way? Job said, I came naked into this world, and I'll leave the same way. I brought nothing in, I will take nothing out. Be careful what your eyes lead you to do. Because I can assure you, if it ain't of God, it's vain. It don't have lasting value. When you die, if it ain't still there, Why did you work so hard for it? Why did you chase it so often? If when you die, it is simply left behind. No, the treasure is coming. It's in another land. That's what I'm working for. That's what I want to be steadfast on. Unmovable. And abound somehow, God, make me abound. Somehow help me to abound in this work. Why? Because that matters. That 
has lasting value. That is laid up in heaven. One day, Oh, it'll be worth more than anything this world could have ever offered. Ever. May God help us to turn our eyes from the vanity of this world. (laughs) You got to make your own choice, but I'm telling you right now, God help me. Hold my head fast to the only thing I see is you. for the sake of an eternal future, but also for the sake of everyone in my life. Because if I can't live it, I shouldn't expect you to. Turn my head, God, and help me. What a prayer. What a, what power in those eight verses he shared with us. A prayer that, it, that surrenders our mind to God. It surrenders our will to God and then it surrenders our body to God. You want to lay up treasures in heaven? Pray that prayer. Pray those those few verses that we've been trying to, to go through the last few weeks. What a wondrous prayer from the heart if we can truly pray it and mean it. I believe God will help us with it. Stand as we sing. You're here tonight and need him. Mm-hmm.